Welcome to Key Conversations, where you get to connect with the best of the music business, unlocking the secrets to exploding your music career, presented by In the Key of Success. I'm your host, Cheryl B. Inglehart. The conversations you're about to hear are between our special guest and participants of my MX4 course, the Marketing and Branding, Money Making, Mentorship Mastermind for Musicians. They are singers, songwriters, composers, producers, and artists just like you asking their burning questions of our experts while transforming their careers over six weeks. If you think this could be you, check out mx4course.com to schedule a free half-hour coaching call with me to see if we'd be a good fit. So let's get started. We are back with Chandler Coyle. We are picking it up where we left off last week. Chandler, your your motivation and what you provide for other people is really that connection with fans. Like that's, if you were to boil it down, that is the focus of what you do. Right. And where Once you're- I get over the this, this shyness of being like in an awkward situation and I get to know someone, mm-hmm. then my mind goes to how can I help this person? Yeah. And Cheryl, as a teacher, probably feels the same way you totally do that you see the person's world and you want to connect them uh to things that will improve their world it's an altruistic i i'm i'm the son of a teacher uh i'm married to a a a teacher so my mom was a teacher yeah my mom was a teacher i've never put two and two together that it's a teacher thing maybe it's a teacher. yeah and then i fell into teaching um five years ago and realized, oh, this is this is helpful. Like I every every term I have anywhere from forty to a hundred students that I get to help. And and so the beginning of the term is like Christmas. I get to open up each student's world and find out how I can help. That's yeah. You know, and you if, you, if, do that if you do that as any teacher, yeah. Yeah. And if you I was apply, gonna say Danny's a guitar teacher too. And I was gonna bring Danny into right. the conversation as a as a teacher. It's a different you, you get the same sort of feeling, right? Well, yeah, and then Danny gets to interact. I mean, the thing is, on a day-to-day basis, if you interact with people and you don't find out how they're connected, it's a, we're all a network. The six degrees of separation is amazing. The the Kevin Bacon, you know, uh, game. It's interesting how even Cheryl and I were talking last week, and she connected some dots between uh, Rachel and some people that you know they know in common, and it's like this world is really connected. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes it comes back and it's like, you know, you get a job because someone says, oh, you're considering Danny for this? I know Danny, he's awesome. You know, that's 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 what happens when you just get to know, you know, expand your network. I know connections are a big thing for this course, you know, making connections. And um, yeah. sometimes it's just being helpful and you get remembered as that helpful person. The next time they think of you, it's a connection that helped you. Yeah, as long as you're not remembered as that total asshole jerk. Like, <laughs> you walk away from an interaction and, you're, and people are like, oh, that guy. As, as long as it's not that, then you're good. Yeah. Um, let's keep going here. That, sure. Gary, again, awesome, awesome conversation starter question. That's really great. Um, Danny, do you have a last question for Chandler? Um, sure. I, I guess I was wondering what your opinion is on the role of uh, like a PR company or publicist. And if your company or you work sort of in tandem with, with your clients with like a PR agent, or if you maybe act kind of as a PR agent. Or what? Yeah, we don't do any PR work, publicity stuff. Um, we've worked in tandem. Uh, I've worked like uh, with Rachel's last product pro- project or album. Uh, I worked with BB gun. Uh, they're out in LA, I think. Uh, and then she's currently touring Europe, so we're working with Partisan over there. And it's it's a lot of coordination because um, they're trying to get articles pitched, uh, video appearances, you know, a- anything to do. And and there's also if there's radio promotion involved, you want the team to be on the same page because if the person, whether it's the band, the manager, or maybe someone like me, an outside person who's handling like the messaging to fans and the socials sort of like the the communication you want to be making sure that that person is aware of the schedule when articles are coming out because most articles wind up online uh, a lot of people who do things and get placements they'll expect the artist's socials to link to that article so there's a lot of communications and importance to that my thing about publicity uh, is 
a publicist is essentially selling you two, well, three things ultimately, but um, one is their list of contacts, so their relationships, two, their time, and three, their expertise. And if, if you're going out and looking for a publicist and they're not in love with your music, move on. You know, like if, if they don't come back like excited to work with you and it's an authentic excitement, then find another one. Um, I've, I recommend my students don't hire a publicist until they are basically getting to a point where it's their publicity they're getting a little traction, but if they only had more time or if they only had more contacts, then they would get to the next level. Then you know you need a pro. Um, and a lot of publicists will say, well, where have you, it's a catch-22, where, where have you been written about? And if you're like zero, um, a publicist is just going to charge you a monthly fee and maybe give you a little benefit, but they can't guarantee placements, just like a radio plugger can't guarantee airplay. Uh, you know, it's different than hiring someone to build your website. You're, you know, at the end, you're going to have a website. But a publicity campaign is, you know, you can do a lot on your own. I would recommend everything that you do. Like Cheryl, Cheryl said, I know how to code HTML. So do I. But I use services like Squarespace and Banzoogle because it's easier. Mm-hmm. Learn, learn how to do publicity for yourself. And then when you go to hire one, you'll know... Um, you'll you'll be able to hear back like, oh, that person's really not into our music. Uh, The other important thing is find someone who's almost like a mentor. You want like whatever you do in the world. And I did this even when I was starting back into the music space is I found a couple people who were like a level or two above me doing what I wanted to do Um, and watched what they did, tried to interact with them, maybe asked for, uh, like who do they use in this thing and just just develop a relationship. I was always being helpful. So yeah, you know, initially I would offer things so that they'd look at me as as a resource rather than a taker. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you look at that, if you're a band, look for a band maybe that is a couple levels above and notice who their manager is, who their publicist is, who their radio promotions people, um, you know, just looking at that level and and ask them if your genre is similar to theirs then maybe their publicists would be willing to work with you when you're ready. Um, but a good tip uh, that I got, and I, I mean, I say this from, I have worked with the $800 a month for six month publicist. Yep. I have interviewed with ones that were like $4,000 a month that you have to sign for three months. Yep. I've done radio campaigns with people. Radio campaigns definitely only do if you're touring. They are not yeah. worth anything unless you can go to those stations, get some relationships and use them as anchor gigs in cities you've never been to before and promote your shows. But that all being said, um, if wherever you are located, there's a local cable station, TV station that has little local segments. It is so easy to call and say, hi, I'm a local artist. I'm, I'm starting to tour nationally. I would love to come on and play a song. I've done that so many times. It's really easy. And then when you finally do want a publicist, you can say, yeah, I've been on the local ABC. I've been on local NBC. And you just say local and then this huge network and then they see that that's that you're a working and they're you're not just going to like right. slide by. Um, and it's also really easy to submit your music to get reviews. If you need a couple reviews to get going, like ask your fans to write up some reviews. I'm sure there's some bloggers on your fan list and, you know, you, there are ways to sort of build your, you know, it's the chicken or the egg conversation. We need yeah. publicity to get publicity. You can create that first round of publicity um, just by, by doing a little bit of research and outreach. Um, again, that's something we, we are going to tackle next week. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I, I am totally in line with what Chandler said is you, you don't need to pay for that, especially because there's no guarantees with, with PR and PR public relations really is about managing your relationship with the public. Right. Um, that's what it technically means. Like Justin Bieber has a PR agent who manages when he gets drunk and looks like an idiot and they like, they have to do PR work. So when we talk about PR as musicians, it's actually a little off what it technically is. We are right. just, we're talking about marketing. Emotional. Like that's what, you know, right. So it's yep. a, a PR person is, is it's a different I'm not saying anything against PR. I've known a bunch of great people and I've definitely gotten some good buzz, right? They're the buzz creators for right. you. It is a, it is an investment. And sometimes it's like, all right, where do I want to put that $2,000? Is right. it going to be worth it? Or should I go do MX4? You should do MX4. Um, right. And it's not $2,000. <laughs> 
Um, right. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's it's a tricky conversation. One of the like foot in the door, maybe you know, thinking outside the box, outside the uh, you know typical box, is find a unique something that's unique about you. It doesn't mean a unique story, unique talent. Um, what happened with Rachel last year? One of the best features and um, what well, are two best features were in outlets that wouldn't normally, you know, it wasn't Rolling Stone, it wasn't Pitchfork, it was, she got written up on digital trends, and then also on, um, which is a big tech blog, and then also in like Electronic Musician, which um, the angle was that she recorded a lot of the, her recent album in her home, and, uh, you know, a wood in the woods, in the Woodstock area, she's, she set up a recording studio in her home. So electronic and, and a lot of the, the soundscapes on her album were interesting and a lot of programming for this. the woman who's known as sort of the singer songwriter that was unique. Um, and she recorded like rain with her iPhone and that's in one of the songs and, and like somebody playing on uh, an ironing board and, and metal chairs and stuff. So these magazines interviewed her, or these, these publications interviewed her and they did the most in-depth articles I saw of that album. And it was her thinking, she told her publicist, find outlets that are outside the norm. Because what happens is those people are really interested in talking with artists about that stuff. Um, yeah, you it's know. true. It's totally true. One of, the, one of the three publicity companies I hired was not a music agent. It was a friend who had, and she worked in luxury brands. And I wow. was like, listen, I want to, so I ended up, I played some $10,000 paid paying gigs at fancy hotels. Like they, because they represented that hotel and they, they had a completely different roster, but it was, there was a restaurant, there was some, you know, it was a really interesting relationship that worked for a little while until they sort of right. ran out of, they tried everything with me. And then I was like, okay, it's not working anymore. But yeah. uh, the, and one of the biggest articles that I, I was in featured in women's world, I'm like, okay, let's pull the, yeah. the female entrepreneur angle. There's different angles to your story. Well, that's, that's a good, especially for women and, and minorities. These, these days is, is it's definitely still a disadvantage in this world. It's, it's unfortunate, but use that to your advantage because there are, publications and outlets and, and they're just more open even like at south by southwest you can't have four white guys on a panel anymore they just won't allow it you gotta you know you gotta have the the somebody to diversify the panel well there's publications that are out there looking for that someone like cheryl someone like rachel she gets she rachel plays up her self-management thing to, to get some interest in some outlets because oh a female artist who's self-managed i want to talk to her um, yeah. I want to mention something that that is uh, that's underutilized in the world of music as a promotional tool, a fan engagement tool, and also a publicity tool. Is artists or musicians, composers or whatever, doing podcasts um, and then interviewing people that you want to make connections to. Like if I didn't know Cheryl and she reached out to me, it would have been an instant yes because I want to make a connection with Cheryl. I want to promote my you know, work. And I love, you know, just conversations like this. So it's an opportunity. Like I know Matt works, he's someone who does a podcast. There's a couple other musicians who do podcasts, but there's not a lot of people doing podcasts who are musicians, like just open source your work, like your, your efforts, like what, what are you doing this week? But it gives you license to ring up someone that you've been trying to meet and say, to them or their publicist, I want to interview you for my podcast. Uh, they might push back and say, who have you interviewed and how big is your audience? But I've seen Seth Godin show up on tiny podcasts because someone asked and yeah. he just does those. So you never know. You might you never be able know. And it yeah. takes something to produce a podcast and host it. And so if you wanted to sort of start up and see if that was something you want to do, you could also do it for a blog. I want to interview you for a blog and transfer. Right. Um, so Danny, is this quick? Is this yeah, quick? I just wanted to, question. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with that, that I, I did a blog on my website and I was able to interview some people that I would have had no business talking to just by saying, Hey, I run a blog, do you mind doing an interview? Yes. That's what it works. Okay. I just want to confirm the validity of that for sure. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Uh, 
All right, let's get to Paul's last question and see see if we can we can make this laser. But, uh, if you've got another one, do you have another question? No. Yeah, I can I can make it brief. Um, you actually touched on a home recording a few minutes ago, and that's what I wanted to ask you about because I'm very like, I don't know if picky is the right word or anxious about what I put online. We're getting ready to record towards the end of the year, like in a real studio, but some of the other people in the band want to do some home recording, like a demo quality stuff and kind of put that out like on the website or on social media. And my concern is that somebody important is going to see it or hear it. And then they're going to be like, ah, oh, these guys are, you know, this is amateur stuff. They're just using pro tools from home and, you know, maybe not knowing that this is just kind of a strategy to get the fans involved and see what they like. Well, I, I would I always opt with the the like if you're happy like don't worry about the cigar chomping label dude or okay. like that that's an old uh, old worry that it's probably you will gain more from being uh, like thinking thinking of the fans and and just putting stuff out there these days like if you're not if you don't have something new out there people are checking out Justin Bieber's new track. You know, it's like, uh, not saying you need to put out something that isn't worthy. Like if it's, if it's art that you want to share, put it out there. Like okay. some art, some now, if you're, if you're getting to a level where you're going to be working with the public publicists and all that, that's, they might want to have a say of like, don't like let that stuff out in the world or it won't get written about. But if you're trying to get traction and build a fan base and attract attention, uh, put the art that, you know, get it to a point, don't be a perfectionist, but get it to a point where it sounds good. Um, Rachel had a really successful noise trade campaign about five years ago when we were trying to build up her mailing list. She worked with her engineer uh, over a course of a week to re-record some songs and get them to the, you know, so it wasn't like crappy demo quality. We put it up on noise trade and she got over 20,000 um, email download, like 20,000 emails from people downloading that, you know, because her fan base was like, hungry for unreleased stuff. Um, and, you know, if it's not out there, people can interact with your music. Because, uh, like, I know you're a musician, and if I went to your website and there was one track, I would listen to it and I would move on. Uh, but if there's a new track, then it's something to talk about. You know, I, I, I never worry about, like, jinxing the future big dude because you sound like crap. Um, the hope is you would rather work with someone who sees a jewel in the rough that could, you know, it's, it's usually the core. It's like, I hear, I hear a single is, is more of the thing rather than I hear bad pro tools, home production. Right. And uh, you can also tell them like, in yeah. you, you can say like home demo recording right. in the title of but the track. Look behind so, Cheryl, look at that pro level vocal booth. That, that's a $200 mic. That's a Rode N21A. My, my mix. Well, I know I have the same mic, but <laughs> I right, mean, but it, look at, it looks she's great. got the, the baffling. I mean, that's, that's not a, I made this, I made this, uh, you know, the, those like little room things that go right. around a microphone. I saw, I went online. I was like $400, no way. And no. I got some like rubber and, and spent like maybe $10 on that and put white fuzzy stuff from a blanket around it. It looks great. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you literally just tell people what it is. Okay. And, and I, I love that question because it's always like, do we wait till it's perfect? Do we wait? And I, and I love the quote, it's better done than perfect. Well, then there's the John Lennon quote, quote or is this the Bob Dylan quote? Uh, uh, what is it? Life, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Like you, as you're working on Pro Tools, the rest of the world is moving forward and listening to other stuff. Like yeah. as you're worried about something, the world, you know, the day happens, you have, um, you know, 86,400 seconds a day. It's going to happen whether you put something out in the world or not. Yeah. And, and another great thing just to sort of piggyback on to, to Chandler's answer is people will get to know that song in its demo form. I did a, a sponsor a song a month. I did one song a month and I recorded it myself for 12 months. And then at the end of the year, I had 12 12 songs and people yeah. to sponsor a specific song and then I went to and recorded them and mixed them and then I got an album so people were even buying the song as a single and then I got the new full recorded version and it was a different version 
people will compare, do that thing. But that I sort of did like a year long fan funding and it was the same idea of just getting stuff out, even if it wasn't perfect. But I was super clear about what it was. I was like, this is not a new record. This is this is us playing around with what this sounds like when we record it from home. And if you can put that in the description or right. the title, then it's okay. not even if someone important finds first of all, who right. is finding anyone's music these days? Like no one's right. Like it's not a thing. Like I like maybe Sarah Bareilles doesn't want to put crappy demos on Spotify with the same names as the eventual single that she releases because then it gets confusing and stuff. But we're we're not Sarah Bareilles. We're not starring on Broadway today. So you know it's like in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. Great questions. Um, so Chandler, is there anything that like we haven't touched on that you really need to tell musicians that are listening? Um, I feel like this was a very broad, awesome conversation. You guys brought yeah. great questions, but is there anything missing that you want to put in before we, we call it for the day? Yeah, I would, the, probably like the things that I see right away, the people are doing is making sure that every profile or service that your music is available on, that you maximize the utility of that service. It's some example is if, if your music is on Shazam, if it's Shazamable, then make sure that you verify your artist profile and get access to that. If your music is on Spotify, make sure that you get access to their fan insights and that you create a featured track and you get verified when you get 250 followers. Pandora's artist marketing platform. If your music isn't on Pandora, try to submit it. Indie artists can submit. They don't take everything, but you know, try to get it on there. Bands in Town and Songkick. If you are playing live, your tour date should be in both services. And Bands in Town allows people to track you, mm-hmm. encourage people to track you. Like we on Rachel's tour page, we have the Bands in Town track button. And she has 67,000 people tracking her. And recently we just started uh, sending messages through the free messages through Facebook that go out. I get a notification on my phone that says, Rachel sent a message. Spoon sends messages almost every day. Um, And you can link to things like videos or email um, downloads. Like we've gotten hundreds of emails for her list based on bands and town messages. They also let you promote shows. So you could could pay them a nickel per fan, minimum 150 per email, to promote a tour or a show or, or stuff like that. You know, there's services like Google Play lets you have access to your profile, um, you know, just any service. And if you don't have access yet, find out, am I eligible to get access? Um, whether you're creating music and not touring, but you're putting music up on Spotify, all of that applies. The tour stuff obviously only applies to live shows, but uh, you can create profiles. And, and my goal, <laughs> Rachel and I are like, what can we get? What, what, what don't we have to pay for? And then what do we have to pay for and what would be worth paying for? And one of the things that was worth paying for was the bands in town to promote a tour in Europe. We did, we're sending out an email today to like 3000 people who track her and we're paying a nickel per person to send that out. And the cool thing is they actually, when the first time you do it, you can get a $50 code. So it ends up being cheaper, but Songkick sends tour dates to Spotify, SoundCloud, Hype Machine, Deezer, Bandcamp and beyond. Um, so a lot of these things, people think they worry about Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, but they don't think that there's, think of the other services mm. that you, you can go into. The other thing that I want to end, sort of end this down to a really simple thing, and it goes along with the always be collecting, is email, email, email. Always be thinking, how can I get someone's email, whether it's a connection or a contact, you know, like. Ask them for their, can I email you to follow up or whatever, uh, you know, like, and I'll give you guys my email after the fact. But uh, so is with fans at a show, I've seen bands put uh, text, whatever, whatever, to join our mailing list and get a free download. I've heard bands mention it on stage, uh, you know, not on Jovi level, but, you know, I've, I've been places where the band members are walking around with clipboards every email is a person and it's an opportunity to convert that person from a casual fan into a super fan. But if you don't have them on your mailing list, you, you, there's no way you can engage with them when they're not hanging out at your show. So So. 
Awesome. It's all those links, by the way, that Chandler just went through, those will be on the, if you go to in the key of success.com slash podcast, it'll be in the show notes. So if you're like trying to go back and take notes, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll list literally all of, all of those links that you just um, spewed out, which is awesome. You can check too, if you're, if you're distributing your music through CD Baby or TuneCore or whoever, you can log in and see where your music has opted in. Cause sometimes if you just select opt me into all, that's awesome. But you know, it's hard. You don't get notifications about it. I don't think so right, yeah. you have to go check. Um, Definitely. Like that's a good, you bring up a good point. TuneCore, CD Baby, DistroKid offer mm -hmm. value added services. A lot of them free to help you promote your music, especially CD Baby. They're really good at, at figuring out things, testing it on themselves and then putting it in their product. Yep. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of what's available. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, Thank you so much, Chandler. There is so much packed into this hour um, or so much packed into this session. I think this is going to be a two-part. <laughs> Chandler, thank you for being here. You spent a ton of time with us. Great questions from everyone in the MX4 course. So thank you yeah, for- Great questions. Thank you. For those of you interested in getting your music placed in different types of media, we are going to speak to Erin Dillon next week. She is Director of Creative Services at Song Trader. So this is going to be a great interview you do not want to miss. Please don't forget to rate and comment on iTunes and Stitcher Radio if you like this podcast. It's the best way to keep it going, get more subscribers, and continue to share this awesome information with the indie music community. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. All of the music on this podcast was provided by yours truly. The theme song is called Inevitably, and it was written with Cameron Ernst and produced by Joey Auk. If you're interested to find out more about my own composing and songwriting projects, go to cbemusic.com. If you're a musician looking to really get some results that you're psyched about in your music career, then head to inthekeyofsuccess.com, where I've created a bunch of different kinds of resources just for you. Key Conversations is sponsored in part by Bandzoogle. They make it easy to build a beautiful website for your music. Their step-by-step -step system gets you online in minutes, and you can choose from hundreds of mobile-friendly themes and customize them with their easy point-and-click editor. All the features you could possibly imagine for a professional website are built in. So because you are a Key Conversations podcast listener, you get a special three-month free trial just for you. Go to www.inthekeyofsuccess.com slash resources and click on the Banzoogle logo to access your free extended trial.